So, Kaidim Kol, a mama shayasha koich, but oil them to take out. We have Yidin here from different neighborhoods in South Florida, the oil taking out from their day to uh, to come here today. A grace in Yasha Koich to, or as a Chavich Meshbacha, for literally opening up their home to us, to the Chaydu. Baruch Hashem, it's mamash, mamash, beautiful Kiyad Amelech over here, Baruch Hashem. And a grace in Yasha Koich to shul.com to Reb Jonathan for uh, the schus of having Rabbi Olbam over here. Baruch Hashem, we enjoy the knaka, the geshmaka, powerful drosha in the coil already in the morning and and Baruch Hashem, we're able to chap around a part two and um, and again, you should be able to should give him koyach like I heard of a singer say from the guest of Marbet's Torah in, in Florida for sure. You should, pack a, it should keep on spreading and it should catch fire even more and he should be able to he should be zoiche to have the koyach to accomplish and be marbut stoyer from one end of the world to the next day Hashem. so mamish without further ado the the rabbi Obama is already Hashem, here for many hours he left us home he left us his dear in west palm beach uh, quite early in the morning so we don't want to take uh, without further ado it's mamish as an honor to have him here and we'll hear a little bit of a divri chizik for the oilim um, and then, just for the item to know, I'm going to speak a few words and if she Rabbi Singer a couple of words. Be'ezer Hashem. Ashkoich Tako Dura Shekoil for coming out as well. Okay. And uh, I had no idea I was going to be here a couple of days ago. I have to give credit to Rev. Jonathan over here, who I've never met before, never heard of him before. Uh, somehow, uh, through the modern advances of technology called the telephone and uh, maybe emails of some sort. Uh, we made contact and just um, one mitzvah led to another now to be able to be here as a very, very good follow-up of a Kulni Mitzvah Geres Mitzvah. And there's a story told about a Holocaust survivor that came to New York and he said to himself that this is a new world now. As a result of that, he says, in the old world, he said, I was a nobody. I was sitting in the back of the base medrash. Nobody would look at me. But now this is a new world. And really here, I want to be somebody. I want to be somebody that's recognized. And therefore, what he does is he goes and he buys himself a fancy suit and he buys himself a hat. And he looked at him. He looked uh, no less than a bank president. And he said, not only that, he says, I'm going to sit also in the front of the shul. He says, not the way it used to be in the old country. And uh, fine, it comes to Kriya Satoira, and then the, the Gabe calls out, is there a coin in the room? Flash, he says, I also want to be a coin, which in the old country I never was a coin. So he calls out and says, yeah, I'm a coin. And he goes up. And after that, he usually, after the Aliyah, goes over to the Rav. The Rav sees him. He looks at him, the Rav says, Zundel? Yeah. He says, when are you a Koyan? He said, I remember your father. Your father's not a Koyan. I remember your grandfather. How are you a Koyan? He says, that's a Koyan. He said, this is America. If you can be a Rav, I can be a Koyan. <laughs> I, I think that this is just human nature that people uh, try to ingratiate themselves and uh, try to claim many, many things that they really aren't. I think today we're living in an oil of my Sheker already know that in fact, that all of it is really not true. And as the Mishnah says in others, ain't covered in the Torah. She never covered Chachomim in Cholu. That's really what it's called, our Torah. So I think the following, you know, in any generation, Klaalishol always had Nishoyinus. Always had Nishoyinus. There was time the Klaalishol had Nishoyinus with, uh, with Kashrus. Kashrus was not a uh, simple thing. I mean, even now in America, which we, Baruch Hashem, you know, in terms of Kashrus, Maybe in this change about which symbols are considered to be, you know, the kosher symbols. Enough kosher for me or not. Uh, but the fact is that somebody is looking for kashras, he's able to find kashras. Which is not the case many years ago in the late 1800s. The Goyen the Ritbaz wrote the Pirish and the Yushalmi. 
who, by the way, is not just a Goyen Yerushalmi, but also he basically was a book in Babli, Mamish, word for word, of Mr. Zalman, it's called Chonan, where Mamish is spoiled from the tremendous Goyen of the Ritbaz. And Ritbaz was here in America, it was in Chicago. And you can take a look a little bit with the Matzah was in Chicago, and the Hagdom de Shal, Sichuv is based Ritbaz. So besides the Pirish Ritbaz and Yerushalmi, you have the safer base with Baz, and look at the Agdoma. And you see how he was fighting with the butchers. He was fighting pressure with the butchers to the forecasterists. Mm-hmm. Turns out that the butchers at that time were Machal Shabbos. They were Yiddish speaking people, they spoke Yiddish, but Lamai said they didn't hold much. And as a result, he points out, and he says that, to use the word in Yiddish, he says, Mendel, means you can eat from his, uh, you know, from his Kalim, just because the name is Mendel. And uh, as much as he tried, it didn't work. He threw up his hands and, and he left. As a matter of fact, what the Ritbaz said at that time, which was a half of the fella, he said, we're so upset, and he said, there'll never be tired in America. So Schneer Kotler, many years ago, he met with Chaim Kreisvert, with Chief Rabbi of Antwerp, and he says, uh, Ritbaz was an Odom Godel. When Godel says something, it has to have meaning. And Ritbaz said, there'll never be tired in America. The fact is, Hashem, not only there's tired, tired is flourishing. Many, many communities we see to have been restored to unimaginable proportions. I mean, after the Muhammad, after the war, came out, any of the old yeshivas have rebuilt themselves, uh, whether it's in the Hasidic world, whether it's in the Yerma yeshivas, in the Yerma Torah. They all are flourishing, Baruch Hashem, and continue to grow. So what does Baz mean? The Nebbi Torah in America. So Chaim Christ we said, you know what Red Baz meant? The Nebbi Torah in America. But he said, when Aaron came, he transplanted Klatsk in America. So this is not the Kark of America that it was before Aaron came. When the Satmar Rav came, he transplanted Satmar in America. And so every Rebbe and every Mani Yisrael that came, what the Baz meant is, on the Kark of America per se, in the soil of America, it will never be. But when they came here, they Makadish all of their Makaymas. And that's why, Avada and Avada, we see that there is, in fact, that there is Torah. There were Tukufas that there were the Sionists of Shemir Shabbos. So everybody knows in America, in the early centuries, in the 1900s. Uh, you don't come in Saturday, you don't come in Monday. Tremendous Messiah Snefesh for Shabbos. And matter of fact, we have to have a course of toy for those who did have Messiah Snefesh. They blazed the trail for others that later on that they broke it through. That now if you want to be a Shemir Shabbos, in most cases you're able to be a Shemir Shabbos. You don't have those old Messiahists. There was a manim where there were nisyonis regarding Taras and Mishpoche. Many places in America did not have any mikvoy. As a matter of fact, in the 1930s, there was a rov, who was a rabbi in Sacramento, who wrote a booklet, which I recently saw some excerpts on that book. Basically, how to build a mikveh in your closet, he said, something like that for $150, going back like in the 1920s or so. If you go through that book, you're going to find out that many, many of the, uh, whether the halachic advice that he gave are very, very questionable. But looking at the time, at that time, for him, he was laughed out of the street, by, hey, build a mikveh in your closet. But the idea was, boy, to be able to have it, some semblance of a tahar zah And partly for him, that was his ticket to Ganeiden, being that he really had serious nefesh for that. To actually bring up and put on the table the concept of a tahar zah mishpoche. Boy, Hashem, today we don't have that problem. However, around 70 years ago, both the Chazonish and Rabbi Lebelzer from two different worlds both came up and said the same thing. The Nisyoinus of our generation are Chinu Chabane. Then maybe we didn't realize it to that what extent. Today we see what's happening. The fact of life is that we have children from the best of families. As a matter of fact, you have identical children. One goes in this direction and one goes in another direction. And sometimes very hard to explain what's the difference. Could be two different homes, maybe. We find for whether the same homes. So obviously you need to have a lot of siyata de shmaya. Blame to be zoicha. To see nachets from your children, your children should go over there, chayosha, to be mamshech, you know, the messiahs, all this. So the truth is, you know, <clears throat> you know, God once pointed out, you think about what's so different about the world we're living in now today, that. It's a phenomenal thing. You see, when Noyach comes out of the table, what happens is he plants a vineyard and he gets drunk. The vehicle Noyach. Noyach. And the question is, all before you match, Noyach was an ish tzaddik. How's a shaykh? Because he builds a vineyard and gets drunk. There's a dove pillar. 
So the Tell one of the point out, Noach Lamai said knew how much he could drink. I want you to listen to this. Noach knew exactly how much he could drink. He would not get drunk. And he only drank that amount. But that amount was before the marble. So that amount of what he drank, he was able to handle. But after the marble, the world totally changed. And therefore, which was, so to speak, acceptable at that time, had a totally different effect. It's a new world. And the same thing also in the world of Chinuch. Many of the situations or the Nisoyim that you had in a previous world, besides having all of the exposure that we are exposed to today, social media and all of the various kalim that we have, it's a different world we're living in. And they have the Nisoyim of Chinuch on a much, much more deep, much more higher level and it's more severe. It's much more challenging. It almost would seem that today to, to walk on the street, you'd have to blindfold yourself and maybe wear earplugs. You, you can't get away from it. A Choshu Manal once told me it was a Manal actually in a Choshu Yeshiva in Queens. He used to commute from, uh, from Brooklyn to Queens every day. And uh, sometime, being that he, he drove, uh, so he was at two, two particular girls who worked in the office, asked them for a ride back, back to Brooklyn. He said, no problem. And uh, he said, listen, uh, just instinctively, I'll listen to the news. But then some such things came up on the news. He said, <laughs> and these two girls were, he himself was sort of like immune to it. You know, all the things that you hear, which, is, which normally, normally would be something which go against the grain, but, but listen to it on a daily basis. But then he realized who he has in the car, he had, he had to close it. Something as innocent as listening to the news is not so innocent anymore. Sometimes it appears so you're invulnerable and by looking at newspapers and things that we have. It's not, it's not the same whether it's advertisements or the kind of news, the things that they talk about, what they bring on the table. So we're living in a totally different kind of a world now. And therefore, of course, the challenges of Chinuch are on a much, much different level. And therefore, going back now to the Ridbaz, let me tell you something. So in 1906, the Ridbaz comes to New York. Before it was early there, it's in Sfas. And that's the way he started a yeshiva. It's called Yeshiva Teres Eretz Yisrael. And the, the task of that yeshiva was to teach Mitzvah Sat Louis Boris. And he was one of the great Leuchim Amman Shemit, way before the Chazanish. Chazanish, as we know, established many, many <coughs> guidelines regarding Shemit. But he did that before that, uh, seeing to it as much as possible. The people keep Shemit as much as Pakehaloche. And uh, anybody go to the old base of Chaim and Tzfas, not far from the Arizal, you know, a couple of yards over, uh, the cave of the Red Baz is over there. As a matter of fact, uh, my, my father's rebel was the Pshol Brach, was Robin Kasho. Not too many, I know, the Hante Kedor, if the people know him, they know about him. But Rabbi Shol Brach took his coma from the Ridbaz on one of his forum called Shol Shol. His name was Shol Shol Brach. And he titles him, Kobalti Skomem, Rabban Shokol Bane Agoil Haridbaz. To my knowledge, I don't remember him writing on any godel of his time. Rabban Shokol Bane Agoil, he wrote it on the Ridbaz. The Ridbaz is here in 1906, and he gave a drosh on the east side, what's called the Pike Street Shul. The shell, the frame of that shul still stands. And he said the following. <coughs> He said, there used to be, years, years ago, there used to be Jewish communities that were called mitzvah yidin. Mitzvah yidin basically means they were yidin, they kai mitzvahs, they kept Shabbos, they kept kashras. They were not tamir chachome. They were machabed tamir chachome. But they themselves were not learned people. They were called mitzvah yidin. The Baal says, mitzvah yidin was something that was shy to exist, he says, years, years ago. Today in our generation, he's already saying that 1906, he's not talking about 2023, he's not talking about that. 1906, in our time, there's no such thing as being a mitzvah yid. Either a Torah yid or no yid at all. 1906. And he, and he explained it. Because the Apostle of Mishnah says, Ner mitzvah v'toyre or. Ner mitzvah, a mitzvah is like a ner, like a candle. Now what are the characteristics of a ner? Characteristic of a candle is, if you light a candle, a candle is able to burn very well as long as the window is closed. There's no outside influences. The moment that you lift or you open the window and you allow the winds to blow in, the outside winds to blow in, to come in, the candle is extinguished. You want to be a mitzvah yid is ner mitzvah. Then you have to live in isolation like a ner. You have to live isolated. You have to be within your daladamas. And basically you are protected by the four walls of your home. And you're not being infiltrated by any outside influences. On the other hand, it says, Torah is an or. Imagine a fire of flame. And have the shalom on a house catches fire. Wind not only does not extinguish it, but the wind actually enforces, fuels the fire even, even stronger. 
That is the Koyach of Torah. Torah is that it's able to withstand any opposition. If you have the Koyach of Torah, if you have the Kedusha of Torah, so now even if you are happen to be exposed from all the foreign winds and all the ideas and all the various ideologies and all the foreign substances and the things that come in and the exposures that you have, the dangerous exposures, but if you have Torah, Torah like an or, Arab, the flame and the fire of Torah purifies that. That's the Koyach of Torah. So therefore, if, if there used to be a time you were able to be a mitzvah, today you cannot be a mitzvah. You cannot survive as a mitzvah. Yeah, if you want to live like a candle, like a nair. Don't step outside. Don't open up anything. Just sit quietly. Don't read too much. Then you're able to, to survive as a mitzvah. But today is either a Torah yid or not a yid. Not a yid b'chlau. And therefore, of course, if that's the case, so that means that the achrayas of educating children it becomes even a greater responsibility because now it's just not a question of how much Torah you know, but actually your whole Yiddishkeit, your whole level of frumkeit, your attachment to Dovish is, is, is how much connection you have to Torah. Because the Torah will determine whether you're a Yid or not a Yid. It's a very serious thing. Many, many years ago there was a Yid <coughs> with a walking crowd around the streets. Uh, he was uh, over 90 years old. And um, someone came over to him and, and wanted to just speak to him a little bit, push it, uh, to give Chizik a 90-year-old Yid. He saw that he seemed like a, like a lost soul walking around. And he began to unfold and he says, you know, he says, uh, I grew up in Russia. I grew up in Russia, he says, in a place which was very, very far from any yeshiva, any Mokim Torah, there was nothing to speak of. But my parents wanted that I should become a Shtikl Talmud Chochem, should become a Shtikl Ben Torah. What they heard at the time, they heard of Grodna Reb Shimishkov's yeshiva. Rabbi Shimshkop, who didn't hear Rabbi So they decided there and then he said that they're going to send me. They sent to learn by Rabbi Shimon. And uh, this turned out at that time it was like a, a week and a half of travel. A little bit of bus, train, train, bus, walking. By the time he says, I reached, I reached Grodna, I was totally exhausted, he says. Totally exhausted. Had my little suitcase. And he said, and I was told ahead of time that if you want to be accepted in Rabbi Shimon's yeshiva, the way it worked was, Rabbi Shim would say, ask you to say shtikl toilet. You would, you would produce and present a kasha or two and give a teretz, and uh, Rabbi Shimon would evaluate, would evaluate what you are saying. By the way, I have a, a member of my family with the Talmud, he says, of Roberto Soloveitchik in Etz So uh, <laughs> he said, we went to Rebel, he says, so Rebel asked him to say a devar toilet. So Rebel had to say it, Vartoy Rebel said to him the following. I'm doing with a little bit of Yiddish. Rebel said, said Zog Kurtz, he says. What he wants you to say, say short. Why? He said, Monashek. Oibs is good, is Kurtz Genug. Oibnish is Kurtz Besser. You got it? English. It's good enough. If it's good, Tyre, it's short is, uh, short is enough. If not, short is better. <laughs> so this is. Uh, so, okay, so, so this, this, was the, this was the outline. This is what you know, this is what you have to do. Is, uh, you, Shimon uh, is going to listen to you and he's going to say it. So finally, he finds he arrives in Grodna and he's asked where the house of Rosh Hashim and he points at Shimon over there and he knocks on the door. <coughs> he, he wasn't even sure if this is the right thing for him. He prepared, by the way, Shtikl Torah because he knew this is what he's going to have to do. And um, sure enough, if Shimon himself opens the door. If Shimon opens the door. If Shimon opens the door. <coughs> He invites him in, and he comes in, and, and Rav Shimon says to him, I want to ask you a couple of questions. He thinks, I said, well, I, oh no, said, Rav Shimon's breaking the rules. He's not supposed to fire me. I'm supposed to be the one, present a kasha or two, and then uh, tell him my shtickle tire, you know, to answer the kasha. Okay, and then he'll decide. Rav Shimon asks him any questions. Says that, uh, right there and then he said, I made a mistake of coming here, but, but I'm here already. And Shimon says, question number one, he says, when was the last time you had a warm meal? Question number two, Rib Shimon says, when was the last time you slept in a warm bed? He said, Rib Shimon put on an apron. This is what he said. He was 90 years old. I know the person who spoke to him. He put on an apron, he went into the kitchen, and he prepared a meal for him. Great Rosh Hashiva, world famous Rosh Hashiva. After that, he prepared a bed for him, put him to sleep, put the cover over him, and made sure that he gets a good night's sleep. Said this seed like this. And the war came. I lost everything. States I had no parents, I had nothing, no children. I lost everything. But I never forgot, he says, 
Rav Shimon's two questions. All the Tyson's kashas that I learned by Rav Shimon, I don't remember anymore. All of the Kivayim's kashas, I don't remember. But the two kashas of Rav Shimon, that's what kept me alive, and that's why my youth still today. And I think that is a very, very essential situation when it comes to Chinuch Velasal. There has to be a feeling inside us when in time of Chinuch that applies whether it's the Chinuch of parents, we're talking about Chinuch of Rabbeim, where a child has to feel that there is a feeling of love, there's a feeling of caring, there's a feeling of tikkuri, there's a real interest in terms of the child's, the child's problem should be your problem. Child's success should be your success. Child's simcha should be the Rebbe's simcha. This is the idea, it should be the Hagosha, this should be the type of the feeling that we should have. And the fact of the matter is, which is sometimes maybe a little bit difficult to say, but this is a question that had been raised and going back already a few hundred years ago. And this is, everybody heard of the Bnei Yisrael, you have to be a uh, Chassidi Shahid. Bnei Yisrael, a number of many others for him, which are not so familiar to many people. Sefer called Derech Pekudecho. Sefer called Magi Ta'aluma Mesechtes Brochis. Sefer called Magi Ta'aluma Mesechtes Brochis from the Bnei Yisrael. On Daf Lamed Beis, he was a Talmud, among others, of Rebbe Mendel of Rimenes. Shomati, he says, Memoiri, her Ave Kodesh, her Mendel Marinenes. And Mendel Marinenes says, Yeshle his palad, there's a Dover pillar. How the child, he says, that young children were given the most highest level of education, the sent to the best Chadorim, and they were learning fine, they were Matzliach in learning. They davened, they learned, that year Shemayim. And then when they grew up, somehow, he says, they went in a different direction. Why? So this is already a question that was raised many, many years ago. I'm not sure that the terrors that he gave is much different than today from some people. Again, Chad Vishon, not painting a brush. And the men will remember that said, because, of course, children that are growing up in a Jewish home, where do they get their food from? From their parents. Where do the parents get the food from? Well, they buy kosher food. How do they buy kosher food? With the money that they earn. Said the Bnei Sosra that the Rebbe of Mendel Marino said the money that they earn is not earned by kashrus, kashrus of gazelle, kashrus of ribis. And the food that is bought with money that is earned, not in a terrific way, has effect later on on the children. Half of the fell, you can look it up there. It's an amazing thing. It's not an answer for everybody. But right away you see, when nobody has a, a Havim in it, first of all, many, many people, by the way, when they're dishonest in business, so many times they cash it themselves, give a lot of money to Tzedakah. That does not cash it. What a mitzvah is a mitzvah. But does not cash the wrongdoing. And many times, other of it. But maybe it's not even a mitzvah either, because of the money that you're giving to Tzedakah, which you stole from somebody else, then you gave to Tzedakah. What kind of a Tzedakah is that? At the end of the day, when you're feeding your family, you never had a havim in a far-reaching effect. But the money that was earned dishonestly, you bought the food, and that food is being ingested by the children of the cadet. Now, we know there's such a concept of tim tumalev. If you eat food that's not kosher, it's matam tum tumalev. You stop the hearts. But that's when the food itself is not kosher. But you don't understand that. You don't want to relate that. It goes so far that if the money is not kosher, the food is kosher food, the mahadrim and the mahadrim, but the money is not kosher. You buy the food, but then non-kosher money, then you feed your kids, this is what happens. I'm going to tell you, don't tell <coughs> But everybody knows, when it says in Shabbat Aflamad Aleph, when a person comes to the next world, you can open the file. They can ask you a number of questions. One of the questions they can ask you, the source of an asato bamuna, did you conduct your business honestly? The next question is, Osak the Batoira. That seems to be the second question. First question was in the source of an asata bamuna. Take the Rishonim and Toysus on the spot, there's a steer. There's another Gemara in Hedron says, Ain't Chilas Dino Yishilodom El Al Divra Toyrus. And Hedron Davdayim. The first thing that a person is going to be asked is regarding Toyrus. So that's the first question. So which is it? Which is it? Ain't Chilas Dino Yishilodom El Al Divra Toyrus. And the Gemara Shabbos says, No, that's the second question. First question in the source of an asata bamuna. Take a look in the El Yarabba, okay, one of the great Puskin of many centuries ago, it was a dine in Prague. 
At the end of Hilchas Natilus Yodayim, Mr. Burr brings Eli Rabba all over the place. Aleph Reish, Eli Rabba, Eli Rabba, Eli Rabba. A Rabba brings from his grandfather, but there's a Rosh Tevis there. Most people will not know it. Shumatim Mipi Zakeni, Mreina Rav Aleph Shin, he writes, Al Bezden Prague. His grandfather was Rav Aaron Shimon Shapira. If you take a look in the Chuvis of that Kufa, when they talk about Rav Aaron Shimon Shapira, they write Rabban Shakol Ben Agoyle. He was literally, he was the God Lador, which is a little bit painful because we're living now in a generation <laughs> where th that name is forgotten. A, a person, while he was alive, was a pillar of the world. With the pillar of the world, Rav Aaron Shimon Shapira, with the Gedoy Lador, Rav in Prague. Prague was one of the most distinguished little rabbinical positions, by the way. Of all time, way before the Nordic Beauty, I'm talking about. Rabban Shem Shapir, Ram Chakol Ben Agolim. Rabban Shem Shapir said like this. He said a teretz. The truth is, the truth is, the first question we're interested is whether you learn Torah or not. Morning Sanhedrin. Ain't Chiladina Shalom Dever Torah. However, however, the first question they ask you is No Sosav and Asata Bumuna. Why? Listen, Rabbi, it's, 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 it's hard to take. Because if the answer is no, if when they ask you, Nasosov and Asata Bamuna, did you conduct your business honestly? You say no, we don't care if you learned or not. Better you didn't learn. Tachil Hashem. You're learning Torah? And your business is dishonest? We're really interested in your Torah. But your Torah doesn't mean anything if it's Nasosov and Asata Bamuna, if you're not conducting your business. Oil the Torah. Ad Fell a Chalavai Rebbe wouldn't teach a Torah. Oyla Leoviv was Megadlin. To them, is what we're interested really is if you learn Torah. But we're not interested in your learning only if no source of Rasat Bamuna. That is the Hagdomer, because if you did not conduct your business honestly, Besef you didn't learn. We're not going to ask you whether you learned or not. Adrab, it's an Avlo that you learned. Torah has to be learned in purity. Torah has to be learned B'kedusha V'tahara. That's how Torah has to be learned. And being that the Ritbaz mentioned that today's time, you can't be a mitzvah yid. It's either a tire yid or not. So every Jewish child, Rabbi, said, needs a Jewish education. It has to be made available. It's not a luxury. It's not a luxury. It's, uh, you know, they used to say years ago, without tire, you know, without tire is menishkata matchuchem. Today you can say without tire is menishka menchotnish. Look at the world outside. Look at the moral degradation of the world. Look how low the, the world has fallen. There used to be a time, there used to be a time even by the non-Jewish world, there was a line that Toivim Shabumas would not cross. Parents also had a certain sense of morality. They didn't want children to see certain things. There was a certain mode of behavior. Not like Eden, but there was a certain mode, there was a certain line. Now, Rabbi Yisai, it's not the question that the lines are blurred. Today we have no lines at all. There's no lines. There's nothing. So without Torah, if you want to say, I'm always without Torah, but that Torah came in Zan Kayid. Yeah, but that Torah came in Zan Kamen. So that's why you can't be a mensch. See what their behavior is. See what it leads to. Of course, as time goes along, as we see the, the Tkufa living in now, you see, there's no such thing. Jewish life is nothing. Jewish life, no life. Human life, it doesn't mean anything. Not going down to the issues of abortion, not going into all of these situations. If, if, if I don't like you, I can kill you. There's no problem. Rob you, Abada Nevada. If I want to have what you have, then I, why not? Why should you have it? I should have it. It's a mistake that you have it. I should have it. This, this is the whole rationale of the world today. So without Torah, forget about Mekeni Zan Kayid. As Ritbaz said, you, you, you can't be a mensch. So every child, Rabbi Isa, has to have a, the ability to have a Jewish education. And therefore I say that, of course, there's all different types of children. But I think that the shayrus of the word chinuch is from chen, to bring out the chen of each and every child. Every child has a chen. You have to bring it out. That's the koyach of a rebbe, that's the idea of a parent. Not on the same level. Not on the same, but every child. Every child has his certain chen. Whatever he has is able to contribute to society in his own way. But that is our challenge, that is our way to try to bring out the best what he's able to be. To bring out that chen. With the shayrus of the word chinuch. And therefore I say like this, when you say in the davening, you say, V'chol b'nayich limudei Hashem. All your children should be learning Torah. Al tikra b'nayich, elo, boy noyich. What do you mean al tikra? It doesn't say that. It's an old kasha, the Shlach Kodesh asked that question. 
Don't read it, Bonoich, read it. Well, it doesn't say Bonoich, it says Bonoich. So, Shlomo Kodesh says, whenever it says Al Tikr, it tries to explain something. There's a kasher. So, I'm going to tell you what I think. The Chol Bonoich Lemud Hashem, that every child is able to learn Torah on some level. It says Kol, Kol is a ribui. Kol is a ribui. What does it mean a ribui? Ribui means every, no exception, every child. The question is, what happened to the Shvachet children? What happened to the Shvachet children? The answer is, Al Tikra Bonoich, it's not going to happen. El Boy Noich, you have to build them up. If you're going to build up the child, then Vachol Bonoich Limud Hashem. Al Tikra Bonoich, don't think Vachol Bonoich, all your children, unless from the children are going to be Boy Noich. So Boy Noich is explained to Bonoich. The Bizoich to have Chol Bonoich Limud Hashem, when is it going to happen? El Boy Noich, when you're going to read in the Bonoich, you can read Boy Noich. They have to build them up. So I conclude with the following. You know, <coughs> sometimes you find the Chazal things, that, which is really, it's really incredible situation. Let's Chazal themselves say it, and you know that it's Kodesh Koshim. Chazal is saying it. In Medrash Tanchum and Pajas Chukas, there's a little story. For that alone, everything is worth. Just for that alone. The story talks about a Yid that was traveling from Traveling from Shalayim, from Eretz Yisrael down to Bovel. Those days it was not as easy. Today you can travel from Chutzlor, it's faster to Eretz Yisrael than those days going, you know, from Eretz Yisrael to Bovel. Much easier. So either way, of course, uh, he sets down to rest. It's, it's, it's a long trip. And the Medrash tells us why he's sitting down to rest and he sees two birds fighting. Two birds are fighting each other. And he see two birds are fighting each other, so it uh, caught his interest. He wants to see what's going to happen. So he sees what happens that it keeps changing. One time this bird is on top of the other, the second time the other bird is on top of this one. It goes back and forth. He's very, very interested to see what's going to happen at the end. At the end, it turns out that one particular bird actually is misgaber, right? Overpowers the other bird and he actually kills the other bird. So you have one live bird and you have one bird that's dead. He sees, says the Medrash, because a chazal. He sees that the live bird is flying over to a bush flying over to the bush and plucks out a blade of grass, a blade of a leaf, and takes that leaf down to the dead bird, tickles it, and the bird becomes alive. Which means half of the fella that this bird, Menashemayim of course, discovered the secret of Tchir It's an incredible thing. Discovered the secret of Tchir There's a certain type of a Certain type of a bush, certain type of a leaf that's able to be Machai Mason. It brought the bird alive, said the Medrash. So this person says to himself, Really? I'm going to try it myself. I'm going to try it myself. So he walks over to the bush and he plucks out a leaf. Now he says, I have to find, I have to find this as an object to try it out. So he continues walking down the road and he sees a dead lion. Oh, that's my chance. So he goes and takes that leaf and tickles the nose of the lion and sure enough he brings the lion back to life and the lion as soon becomes alive springs on him jumps on him and kills him that kind of story cerebral yashif beautiful story but what do we learn from that story what do we learn from that story you know what you learn from that story cerebral yashif here you had a yid had a tremendous gift in his hand he had the gift, he had the maftayach of Tchiyas HaMesim, something that the Gemara says right in the beginning, this time this Gemara says, there are three things that are only shloish maftayach, that are only biyodesh kodesh baruchu. And one of them that's always on the hands of the kodesh baruchu, the maftayach of Tchiyas HaMesim is not given over to anyone. And here, he had in his hand the maftayach of Tchiyas HaMesim. Had he had a little bit of seichel, maybe, maybe, instead of trying it out on the lion, maybe he should have gone back, maybe he should have gone to Hebron, Go to Mars and Machpelah. Maybe he should have gone and woken up the other Sagdoshim. He had it. He had, he, had, he had the tool. Or maybe the other way around. Maybe he was going down to Bovel. He go to the cave of Cheskel Anovi. And maybe wake him up. What did he do? He took that tremendous gift and he destroyed his life with it. But Yasha says, so to Rabbi, he says, this is with many of us. Each and every one have a gift, but we're not, we don't recognize it. This he did not recognize the gift that he had. A once in a lifetime gift of Maftesh of Tchisa Mason. But he was not aware of it. 
We too have to now become aware in our own lives, in the way of our children, there's so much more that we're able to do, so much more that we're able to accomplish. But we don't believe that we have it. We don't recognize that we have that gift. And then, instead of using it in a constructive way, many times we use our talents in a destructive way. By the way, take a look at what Gedal Yeshua writes in the Sefer Or Gedal Yo, or Pashas Lechocho. Because Baruch who gives you a talent and you don't use it for the right thing, he'll take it away from you. Gedal Yeshua. Because Baruch will take it away from you. Because Baruch will give you a talent and responsibility. You know, when we, when you have a good talent, we take compliments. Uh, we take it as a compliment. You know, people compliment it. It's not a compliment. It's a responsibility. Because Hashem gave you that talent, it's that Christ will take it to use it. Well, Hashem said, so there's a new yeshiva being built over here. Hashem, everybody, everybody has the yechoyles, each lefi yechoy. Hashem, everybody understands what they, what they, we don't have to explain today what a yeshiva means. Nishka mitzah yid, Rabbi, he said, tayir yid, b'chalal nishka yid. Nishka men, shafilah. It's been said to the Shmaya, big schus, that people have come here for Kim Bechizakatoir, Poison Kovach Sayan, the Vaiter, should all be gedenched, should all be Zeche. To have a bonem and a bonem, Moiskim, a Torah, a Mitzvah, a Simcha, and a Nachas, and to be able to the Shem to see all the Yeshuas that we're all waiting for, and Schus Atoir, that's everything, brings all the Brochus that Klaus was waiting for, and needs, the Shem, Yeshuas, the Fuz, and the Chomis, the Simcha, and the Nachas, and the Sagoel. Amen. 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 Yeah, boy, say, that's good. Stop for a lot. Thank you.